The title tonight of our talk is Listening with an Awakened Heart. And you might have predicted it from the meditation, some of you that know me well. <laughs> I try to gear our meditation some to the theme. And I guess I'd like to ask you a question first, which is how many of you have an intention in your life to listen well? How many is that a conscious intention? Can I see by hands? Okay, that's a lot of us. That's a lot. Um, how many of you feel like you have a good ways to go? <laughs> the same hands, okay. <laughs> it's not easy, is it? We go into a very quick trance, even with the best of intentions, as soon as we're with each other and get, usually there's these strong um, habits of being preoccupied or having an agenda or being self-conscious or rehearsing what we're going to say. It's not so easy, I know. Um, and, and really, when you think of it, learning to be present in communications, listening well, is as profound and challenging a training in presence as any other form of meditation. I mean, in a way, when we're just sitting, we have a lot of inner distractions, but we, in some ways, at least partially, sometimes pull ourselves away from the, uh, all the externals. Not so when we're with each other. So it's challenging, and I think of it as with any uh, great art, any spiritual um, unfolding, that it takes a deliberate practice. That's the uh, languaging of more contemporary languaging, saying that we need to put in our thousand plus hours, you know? Because we're really, it has to do with neuroplasticity. We have very deeply grooved habits of how we relate to each other. And we bring in all of our needs to prove ourselves as somebody or to be, to come up with the right thing or to defend ourselves. We bring that into our communications. So we have these groove patterns, and how do they change? You know, we have to be able to pause and with some intentionality contact in a deeper way presence, our body, our heart, and speak from that. And it's hard to interrupt what really is a kind of tumbling forward that we're in most of the time. Have you noticed that? that many moments were in some way leaning forward, tumbling forward. So it takes intentionality. For most of us, even though we have the intention to practice listening, we don't do it too much, unless we're in some formal training, you know. So I find that really what grabs us is suffering that it's when all of a sudden a relationship hits the skids, you know, we hit that major conflict with our teen or our partner and I are in a standoff, you know, we're just not, or in some way we're, um, we're with a colleague, there's a real hostility that's built, and somehow or other that suffering builds enough so that we realize, or else our therapist tells us, <laughs> you, have to, you have to be more intentional in how you're listening because it really comes down to listening. Now most of our meditation training you can consider as inner listening. That we, um, because we're so hypervigilant, we fixate our attention on all the things around us that might either be dangerous or have something to offer us, including our thoughts. But we don't offer a listening presence to our inner life. So we don't necessarily pick up until maybe way later that we've been feeling lonely or that there's a longing that really wants attention or a sadness. So I'm thinking of the different realms now of, um, you know, where this listening is so critical and we know it with any mature relationship that we have to be able to listen. And we also are coming to realize that 
anywhere there's conflict, whether it's between governments or between races or religions or ethnic groups, if we don't have the capacity to listen and understand the fears, the concerns of the, what seems like other, we'll never have the kind of understanding that can reduce the fear and create a sense of harmony. So we need it. We need it in our social world, we need it in our interpersonal world, and we need it intrapsychically with ourselves. We need to know how to pause, to step out of the busyness and pay attention to what's here. Now, one of the challenges is that as much as we need that, our culture is more ADD, more attention deficit than ever before. Along with speed is loudness. There's a lot of distraction. They say that, and there's an international, let me see what I wrote down, there's an international organization for listening that has these statistics. Um, well, whatever the name of it is. Um, our attention spans about 22 seconds, which is why commercials have to get shorter and louder and more colorful than ever. Have you noticed that? I mean, and, and movies, we know that. You know, the, the frames are just shorter and punchier because we lose our attention. How many of you know what it's like to be on the phone and resist multitasking while you're on the phone? I mean, how often are we... We don't have to do hand raises on this. And I'm talking about not just going to pee. I'm talking about being online and going shopping while you're having a conversation. You know, it... I, I know you know. <laughs> right? And so... Everything in our environment's clamoring for attention and it's getting louder. The newspapers are louder. The radio's louder. You know, everything is like clamoring for attention. And then of course we've got our own inner busyness. Our ways of being preoccupied and racing. So it's very hard to be in a conversation and really arrive. It's hard. So what I'd like to explore in um, our time together in this class really is what does it mean in this moment to listen deeply? I mean, what does that really mean? Okay, what stops us? What's really getting in the way? And how can we cultivate our capacity to really be here for ourselves and each other? And what I'd like to invite you to do, because I think it'll make a difference, is choose one person in your life that you would like to uh, deepen your connection with by listening in a more fully present way. Just pick one person as you listen tonight. So that as we do little, you know, reflections and so on, you can explore that person. But even beyond tonight, if you want to practice, and it takes a kind of commitment to practicing. Those of you from ACT will hear the energy I'm trying to put towards this commitment part. Um, it takes a commitment and if we try to make it too broad, like, okay, I'm going to leave here and I'm really going to pause and whenever I'm with anybody, I'm going to get into a deep listening space. It won't happen. You'll just feel like you're failing and that's not, this, this, that's not a good setup. So pick one place that you want to practice and that'll keep it a little more focused and a little more possible to start deepening your skills. Okay? All right. Okay, so, what does it mean in this moment to listen? And you might consider that. What does it really mean? There's a, a friend of mine who was at a Montessori school, 7 to 11 year olds, uh, doing a, a brief kind of class or meditation with them. And the way he did it was he had a gong, and here's the gong for now, he had a gong, and he said to the kids, what I want you to do is just hear it and follow the sound and watch where it goes. He said, just with interest, watch where it goes. Okay? And he says, if you watch, if you follow it, you might get closer to God. Okay? 
So he did it and he played the gong and they listened. And then um, he found out afterwards, because one of his friend's children was in the class, that um, he, she relayed the conversation afterwards. And the, the little boy said, well, when I watched and listened to where the sound went, he said, I didn't get closer to God. I was God. I was God. And think of it, what happens when we become fully present? We become presence itself. And we're not closer to present, we're presence. We become that, that beingness. Okay? So, um, on the day that I had a talk that involved a gong, I forgot my own gong. <laughs> so you might close your eyes and listen to this one. Just listen and follow the sound and sense where the sound goes. continuing to listen. And as you do, you might sense a listening presence is perhaps the closest template for awareness itself. When there's full listening, there is boundless kind of space for whatever arises, completely receptive. Can you sense the space that's listening? It's like an open sky. And when there's listening, there's also an active engagement, an awakeness. So it's open and awake. If you'd like, you can open your eyes. But as we revisit this, just to keep in mind those two qualities, uh, it's kind of uh, yin-yang, where we sense that there's both this open receptivity and this engaged awakeness, and they both together make for a listening presence. Okay? Now, what we then ask ourselves is, you know, well, what's the challenge? And in a way, meditation's been likened to listening to music. You're not trying to get to the end, right? When you're listening to music? I mean, that would be silly. Why would you turn on a song so you could get to the end, right? You're there to just be, you know, just to let it move through you. And uh, so there's no goal to, there's nothing you're adding. There's nothing you're taking away. If you're really listening to music, you're just being. You're just spontaneously recognizing what's appearing. And meditation and a listening presence is the same. The challenge is that we have huge conditioning to do anything but just be. We have huge conditioning to in some way try to control what's happening, not just that radical allowing, okay? So, how does our conditioning play out? We start looking at it. We quickly have to assert our selfness into situations rather than just hanging in that open openness. And in a communication, what, how do we do it? I mean, if you think about it, our shared reality breaks down because rather than that openness that doesn't interfere with what we're taking in, that openness that can sense the truth of what you're communicating or the truth of reality, we add on our interpretation. 
we take it through our own filter and we add on and project what's going on. That's how we break communications. One of my favorite examples, we, just to say that when I talk about breaking communications, I'm talking about in some way that we, um, we're still engaged but we're not really on the same wavelength. We're not really speaking and understanding each other. So the challenge that goes on, if we think about it in traditional Buddhist terms, there are three conditionings that take us away, that have us break communications, break connections. One of them is wanting. We're wanting something different so we can't just listen. One of them is aversion. We don't like what's happening so we have to control. And the third is neutrality. It doesn't matter to us, so we just... Okay. So let me take them one at a time. And again, I'm going to invite you to think of whoever you're wanting to um, deepen communications with and sense, now, how is this? Is this, is this what's between me and listening with an awake heart? Okay, that's the inquiry. What is between me and listening with an awake heart? Now, when there's wanting, Sometimes it's wanting something from that person and sometimes you're wanting something that has nothing to do with that person, right? But when there's wanting, you can ask yourself, am I wanting for that person to experience me in a certain way? I mean, how often are we talking with someone and even listening to them, but in some way we're wanting them to have a certain experience of us? Is that familiar? It's rare when it's not there. Okay? It's rare when we're not attached to having them have a certain kind of experience of us. And sometimes it's really strong. Sometimes we're really wanting their approval or wanting them to think we're helpful, wanting them to think in some way we're interesting. So that's one inquiry, is to sense, are we wanting the conversation to go in a particular direction? Are we wanting some affirmation, some result? What are we wanting? Now, sometimes the wanting that pulls us from presence has nothing to do with that person, okay? Sometimes um, it may be that we're just wanting to do something different at that moment, that we're wanting to be with someone else, we want to have something to eat, you know, we just don't want to be there. So, check it out, sense for yourself, if there's wanting of anything, how that pulls us away from that pure presence that really is what lets intimacy happen. That's, that's one approach, is the wanting, or one thing that gets in the way. The second, aversion. Now, we know what it's like when it's with that person. If you're in some way feeling threatened by somebody, very hard to have an open listening presence, right? This is, uh, some of you might remember, the Maxine cartoons. And this one says, Guess which four words a woman can say to scare a man out of his wits, okay? And the first frame you see Maxine coming in and she's dressed up like a, fire, a firefighter and she's saying, our house is burning and her husband's reading the newspaper he goes, mm-hmm. Next time she comes in and she's, you know, got like, it's like she has a big octopus that's grabbing at her and she says, the Martians have landed and her husband's reading goes, mm-hmm, oh really? Then she comes in, she's like a doctor, and she goes, you have terminal cancer. And again, he goes, that's nice, honey. <laughs> Last frame, she says, we need to talk. <laughs> ah, no, I don't want to die, no, no. You know, so he goes crazy. So bingo, you got it. We need to talk, right? So when there's fear, when in some way having a real contact with somebody is um, threatening, listening, it's like we're in fight-flight. We're not open, we're tight, okay? So then you might ask yourself, you know, with the person you're considering, is there some fear? Is there something you're organized around that's keeping you from that openness? Just consider. Is there some fear you won't have the right response? some fear of another's judgment or some anger or dislike of how that person's behaving. 
so you can't just listen. Sometimes there's boredom. Sometimes uh, there's kind of a defendedness that we feel the person's going to ask too much of us. There's a, a story I've always loved of Postmaster General G. Edwin Day and he describes his strategy to get a long-winded person off the phone. And he says he's on the phone and when he's in the middle of a sentence he hangs up. He says, because who would hang up on themselves, you know? So it's his way of getting off the phone. <laughs> so we have strategies for distancing. <laughs> One person writes, the process of dying starts at birth and it accelerates at dinner parties. You know? <laughs> so we, we're afraid of boredom, you know? Now, often the aversion doesn't have to do with the particular person. And I want to take some time with this piece that I found is particularly a big one that gets in the way, which is we, many of us, go around with a chronic sense of not enough time. Just in our lives, there's not enough time. I mean, it's in our nervous system that there's not enough time. That in some way we're racing towards the finish line, we're going to miss out on something or not be prepared for something not enough time. So then what happens when that energy and that fear is brought into a communication? There's a sense of this is, it, this is getting in the way. The other is more of an obstacle. How often have you found yourself in some way trying to get out of talking? There um, is a beautiful story that I, I found um, and it is, describes um, this priest is uh, describing how he does masses at these probation camps on Saturday morning um, and then he, goes, then he goes back and he does these baptisms and weddings and so on and um, this is called From Tattoos on the Heart beautiful book. So he describes um, stopping through in the office between things. He's on his way to a baptism. He doesn't have much time. He's, and then a woman in her 30s walks through the door. I immediately glance at the clock hanging on the wall. I check how much time I have left before the baptism and I'm already lamenting that I probably won't get to all the mail. I find out later that the woman's name is Carmen. She's a recognizable figure on First Street and yet this is her first visit to Homeboy. Now just to back up a little, uh, the Homeboy is uh, this industry that was set up for Latino gangs in Los Angeles where they have the most violence of any gang violence anywhere. And it, this whole book is about the um, power of of compassion, of reaching these young people and helping them from a, a life of violence. Uh, so he goes on, he says, Carmen is a heroin addict, a gang member, street person, occasional prostitute, and a champion, Pelionera. Now I'll read you what he says. He says, I need help. She launches right in, brash and something of a no-shit sister. Oh, she says, I've been to like 50 rehabs. I'm known all over, nationwide. She smiles. Her eyes wander around my office and she studies all the photographs hanging there. She multitasks and her inspection of the place doesn't derail her stream of consciousness rambling. The family will arrive for the baptism in five minutes. I went to Catholic school all my life. In fact, I graduated from high school even. In fact, right after graduation is when I started to use heroin. Carmen enters some kind of trance at this point and her speech slows to deliberate and halting. And I have been trying to stop since the moment I began. Then I watch as Carmen tilts her head back until it meets the wall. She stares at the ceiling and in an instant her eyes become these two ponds, water rising to meet their edges, swollen banks spilling over. Then for the first time she really looks at me and straightens. I am a disgrace. Suddenly her shame meets mine. For when Carmen walked through the door, I had mistaken her for an interruption.
you understand? Yeah. There's a, um, a saying that to be kind, we must swerve often from our path. And I feel like that's, for me, one of the, um, the key mantras almost. Because we so regularly think we know where we're going and we're on our way somewhere and we're trying to get there. And here just becomes a quick pass-through point. And any of the beings in our life that are here are, are not the beings that we're going to be hanging with. So to be kind, to offer a listening presence, we have to start having that commitment that says, pause. Don't let this moment be an interruption on the way to something else. This counts too. I mean, this moment. It's an amazing radical cutting through when we get it, that it's this moment now. It's not like our, our freedom's going to come when we're done with class and we've practiced meditation for five years and gone to the retreat and then we're going to have, ah, illumination. It's only when our minds keep rec- remembering, this is it. And I, when I say this, I really mean this, like this moment. Can we come home together right now and listen to the moment? and listen to our hearts and listen to the space that's here whether we're here in this room or we're listening in another country just listen to the space and feel the presence so it's a a thing about stepping out of an old habit of being on our way and really remembering, reconnecting Listen now. Be here now. The most basic fear that is between me and listening with an awake heart when you ask that question, if you really look deeply, is that in a moment of pure listening presence, the self-sense dissolves. If you're listening fully, there's no one home. There's just a space of wakefulness. If you imagine a situation where you're, listen, you're with somebody and they're talking and you imagine letting go of all the thoughts, all the planning, you know, all the judgment, just letting it all go, letting your whole agenda go and just listening, a few things happen. One is if that really if there's really a letting go, you get, oh, there's just space and awakeness, maybe tenderness. But what you also get is then there's this kind of clutch that wants to come back again and start thinking again and start coming up with ideas and get ready to respond because if there's nobody home, we might do it wrong. There's still a sense I need to be here to make it work out. This is the most fundamental clinging that the Buddha described as this this basic primal urge to keep on reconstructing a self. Does that resonate? The sense of, I, I need to be here. And there's fear when we're not familiar with letting go. We face a layer, a deep layer, of fearfulness. That's okay, it's really natural, but it's useful to know about it because then something in us says, okay, just hang out with that a little. Don't so quickly grab for the ideas and thoughts and prepare your response. It kind of gets interesting. It's a bit of an adventure to just pause and just open to how it is. It's very radical. We don't do it much. We really don't listen much in that way. 